Please join me in welcoming Senator John Kyle. Thanks, Kurt. Thank you very much. I, I had the honor one day of, uh, one evening of introducing Henry Kissinger at a very small event. There were about four tables the size of these tables. And um, most of the people there knew Dr. Kissinger at least as well as I did. I used that phrase and he came to the podium where he began to speak. He said, well, <clears throat> while it's true that I need no introduction, no one enjoys one more than I do. <laughs> so I haven't used that line, but uh, thank you very much, Kurt. It is my honor to introduce our luncheon speaker today, and it is an honor. General Mark Welsh is Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force. He's a member of the Joint Chiefs. These are the top military advisors to the leadership of our country, the executive and the legislative branches. <clears throat> and in this capacity, he's also the equivalent of a Chief Operating Officer, the CEO of a large Fortune 500 company managing the strategic planning, investment, and budgetary ex execution of over a $100 billion budget, a workforce of 700,000 people with operations worldwide involving unbelievably complex machinery. And it's in this capacity most relevant to many of you who are CEOs or COOs that General Welsh will share his perspective on leadership in this corporate sense and also in crisis. Some of his missions, by the way, relate to our own Arizona community here, for example, at Luke Air Force Base and its role in training the most advanced fighter pilots in the world. General Welsh is originally from Texas, son of an Air Force oper uh, officer. His wife, Betty, is with us today and is in every sense part of his team. They are both indefatigable advocates for our airmen, spouses, and families. That, he says, is what he enjoys most about his job. It's often, uh, not often, I should say, that we are privileged to hear from an F-16 fighter pilot, associate CIA director, commandant of the Air Force Academy, former flight student at both Davis Monthan and Luke Air Force Base, and the chief of staff of the Air Force. So please join me in welcoming General Mark Welsh. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Senator Kyle, thank you, sir, for taking your time to do that. Um, folks, let me ask my wife, Betty, to stand up so you can see her, because she rocks. She's sitting right here. Betty, would you stand up and just wave? <laughs> One of the cool parts about this job is occasionally I get to travel with her, which is a real thrill, because she's magic. Uh, also at this front table, somebody else I'd like to highlight to you. I think many people in the room already know her, but Karen Taylor is sitting here as well. Karen, would you kind of stand up and wave at the crowd? Karen is a member, Karen has been a supporter of Luke Air Force Base and our airmen and families here for years, and she's a member of my chief of staff of the Air Force Civic Leader Group, which means she devotes an awful lot of her time and energy and expertise to helping me figure out how we do a better job of connecting air bases, communities, and the support they provide to our people. So Karen, thank you for everything you do for us. Folks, it is a real thrill for me to be here. Thanks for letting me take a little bit of your time, and please keep eating. I don't need it, but you probably do. Uh, I'd like to talk about three things with you this afternoon. The first one is a little bit about airmen, because I love airmen. I'm just shameless about it. I want to talk a little bit about air power, just so you kind of know what our Air Force does these days, but I'll keep that part brief. And then I want to talk about a real privilege that you and I share, and that's leadership, especially leadership in uncertain times, which I think today certainly qualifies as. Next slide, please, Alan. By the way, the guy flipping slides here is a great young man named Alan Heritage. He's a lieutenant colonel in our Air Force. He's a public affairs officer. Along with me, I also have a young man named Brandon Schroyer, who's an Air Force major. He's a C-17 pilot. And then Mr. Jason Yaley, who's been our Air Force lead for all the public affairs activities that have been going on out here in the Earth the last couple of weeks. We're ready for the Super Bowl, by the way. The Thunderbirds will be in town here pretty quick, getting ready for the flyby on Sunday. We're hoping the weather clears a little bit. Uh, jets are going to be good. And by the way, if there's any uh, league executives sitting around here, you can rest easy. We have checked and double-checked the pressure in every tire. <laughs> Next slide, please. We won't be a distraction, I promise. I love this picture. General Ray Odierno is a great friend of mine. He's Chief of Staff of the United States Army, and Ray always says that the strength of America is its army. I agree with him, by the way. I think 
The United States Marine Corps reflects the pride of America as well. The United States Navy, it's kind of firm commitment to the enduring values that this nation believes in. And I believe our Air Force reflects the spirit of America, that spirit of adventure that all of us share in some way, shape, or form. Next slide. Americans have always been in inventors and pioneers, explorers. We've done that forever. From when we first fought to stand up this nation, there was something a little bit different about us. The nation wasn't formed and founded upon this idea of a single race or a single religion or a single language. We stood up this nation behind the idea of a single concept. And that idea was that the best thing a nation can provide its citizens is freedom. Nothing else, just freedom. That every individual should determine their own destiny. And that there are some things worth dying for. Next slide. I'm pretty proud of this picture. The guy on the left is my son, John. And Betty and I were there for his graduation from Air Force pilot training a few years ago, along with the guy on the right, who's my father, Mick Welsh. And my dad had been out of the Air Force about 30 years when this picture was taken. He'd served for 35 years in our Air Force. And John had asked him to pin his wings on because my dad had been a fighter pilot in our Air Force for 35 years. He flew and fought in three wars. He was one of that incredible generation of Americans who went through that period of history that was more turbulent than any other in our nation. And I don't know who looks prouder in this picture, but the proudest people in the area were the ones behind the camera. Me and Betty taking a look at this. My dad died about two years after this picture was taken and we buried him in this uniform at his request. And the night before we buried him, I was looking at him in the casket lying there in his uniform and I started to think about all the things he'd done while he wore it for real. I mentioned that he fought in three wars. He really fought in three wars. He was the real deal. He resupplied Patton's 3rd Army breakout across France. He flew a glider into Germany with the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, his one and only glider sortie. He fought with the infantry as he jumped out of that glider for four months across northern Germany. And then he started flying fighter aircraft in our Army Air Corps and then the Air Force. He flew 19 different types of airplanes. He had over 9,000 fighter hours. That'll never happen again in our Air Force. In fact, one of the things John will tell you about this picture, as I heard him say to one of his friends right after it was taken, He's showing his friend this picture and he goes, yeah, between us, we have almost 9,500 hours. <laughs> John had 200 at the time. My dad wore the Silver Star, five distinguished flying crosses. He was nominated for the Congressional Medal of Honor for a mission in Vietnam. He was the man. But he handed a lot more on to John than those wings when he pinned them on his chest. He also passed on an Air Force, an incredibly capable and powerful Air Force. This is what we do. We're not a cosmic organization. We've done the same five things since 1947. The president gave us an executive order, and the only thing that's changed is we've added the word space into the first line. I don't think he thought of that back then. But we do air and space superiority. We do intelligence collection. We do global strike. We do rapid global mobility. We do command and control. And the big thing that's changed since 1947 is we don't just do them in the air domain anymore. We do those missions in, through, or from three different domains now, air, space, and cyber but the missions are the same. It's just what, how do you get access to a target? How do you create an effect? How can you do the same thing more efficiently in or supported by an activity in a different domain? And that's what the future of the Air Force will be. We'll be balancing activity in those domains, just as you balance the domains your business operates in routinely. So this is what we think about every day. Next slide. Let me hit you very quickly with pictures of what these look like. This is air superiority. This is what it looks like in the air. Maybe more importantly, slide, this is what it looks like on the ground. It provides our ground forces, our Army and Marine Corps, even our maritime forces, the freedom to maneuver, the freedom to attack, and it provides them freedom from attack. Since April of 1953, the United States has deployed over 7 million men and women in uniform to contingencies all over the world, and tens of thousands of them have died there. Not one has been killed by a bomb from an enemy aircraft. We are very proud of that record. It's not by accident, and we intend to continue it. Next slide. Space superiority involves about 25,000 airmen every day working 24-7 around the clock, doing everything from managing six satellite constellations, 77 individual satellites, to tracking over 100,000, or excuse me, over 2,500 specific items in space. We track about 25,000 down to about 10 centimeters in size, and then we monitor about 100,000 more. And in the next few years, technology that some of you are helping to generate 
will allow us to quadruple that number and keep track of space debris down to a very, very, very small size. Because it's important not just to the military applications, but to industry and commercial applications. Uh, it also involves space launch. We have launched now 103 consecutive successful space launches that deal with national security. And I'll knock on the only wood I can reach on that one. This is a huge deal, going back to 1999. Huge money, great technology, really, really important to the nation. There is not a single United States military operation today, anywhere on Earth, that happens without support from Air Force Space. Not one. Not many that happen without the things that you do that happen without support from Air Force Space. When you crank up your car and the GPS works, thanks Staff Sergeant Smith. He runs the Constellation at Shriver Air Force Base. He's 21 years old. When you look at your cell phone and the time's always right, think about Staff Sergeant Smith. When you're reading the paper about a precision weapon hitting somebody on the other side of the world, realize that doesn't work if Staff Sergeant Smith's having a bad day. The Air Force has become kind of like the light switch in this room where you walk in, you see the switch. You don't really know what's behind it unless you're an electrical engineer. But every time you flip the switch, the lights come on. That's what our Air Force does in many, many ways for the nation. And I'll give you some more examples of that in a second. Next slide. Oh, that's classified. Uh, take that one off, Al. <laughs> Next slide, please, Al. Yeah, thank you. You ever wondered? <laughs> ISR is a huge mission for us. We have about 35,000 people who do this every day as well. They collect information on space platforms, airborne platforms, sensors that, many, that were designed by U.S. industry and industries overseas. We move that information across the world at the speed of light, just like you move your business data. We process it, we analyze it, we assess it, we distribute it, we disseminate it to leaders who have to make decisions, or sometimes we download it directly to a guy on the ground with something called a rover pad so he can see what's around the next corner or over the next hill. It's incredible technology, it's incredibly helpful, and intelligence has become the coin of the realm in modern warfighting. And nobody provides more of it than your Air Force does. Next slide. Global Strike is one of our other missions that includes everything from close air support to nuclear strike. And the politics of this don't matter to us. We don't decide what the nation will or won't do in nuclear deterrence, for example. Our job's just to execute it if we're told to. Global Strike, this is an interesting picture because it's taken in Kunsan, Korea. The commander at the time in Kunsan, Korea was a guy named Scott Ployce, who many of you met this morning out at Luke Air Force Base. He's now Brigadier General Scott Ployce, the commander here at Luke Air Force Base. And every pilot in every airplane in this picture was trained right here in Arizona at Luke Air Force Base outside of Phoenix. We're pretty proud of being a, a, a state service. Uh, the Air Force is, is really woven into the fabric of this state. And there are people here from this state that I'd like to thank publicly for the way you've accepted our airmen and their families into your businesses, into your churches, into your schools, into your hearts, and into your homes over the years. You've been remarkable, remarkable uh, teammates and partners in all this. Next slide. Luke Air Force Base, as I mentioned, is a going, pop going thing for us. The F-16 training program there is absolutely spectacular. It includes U.S. coalition allies who train with us here at Luke Air Force Base, great airmen, uh, and just fantastic families. And we're transitioning now to training for the F-35, our newest weapon system that's just begun to arrive at Luke. We've just started the training program. This is the next 35 to 40 years of U.S. air power. Next slide. That strategic triad I mentioned, we are responsible for two legs of it. The bomber leg, shown here with the B-2. Next slide. And then, of course, the intercontinental ballistic missile leg. This is a Minuteman III missile on a test launch out of Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. I hope we never, ever, ever see this for real. Next slide. This is what Global Strike looks like if you're the enemy. This is Al Gardabia Airfield in Libya. On the first night of Operation Odyssey Dawn in 2011, a B-1 took off from the Midwestern United States. It flew to Libya. It dropped 16 independently targeted joint direct attack munitions against this airfield, one for each shelter, destroyed every shelter, continued on to a base on the other side of the world, landed, refueled, rearmed, turned around, and hit another base on the way home. Now think about the command and control, the intelligence, the air refueling, uh, the ability to do this is really exceptional. Our people are phenomenally good at what they do. Next slide. We also have a global logistics chain, just like everybody in this room. We have 130,000 airmen who work this every single day. 
It's our air mobility enterprise and includes air refueling and airlift assets. Next slide. We fly 600 strategic airlift sorties a day, one every two and a half minutes, every hour, every day of the year. It never stops. And it supports operations, moving people, equipment for us and for allies all over the planet. Next slide. This is what it looks like if you're a Philippine refugee. Next slide. This is what it looks like if you're a loadmaster getting ready to drop ammunition to Army Fort operating bases in Afghanistan. By the way, we used to have to drop stuff into about 600 meter by 600 meter drop zones. Now we can actually steerable shoot it up a mountain valley and land it on this stage. It's incredible the progress that's been made by the people who do this. Next slide. This is what it looks like if you're a wounded warrior. By the way, this airplane is an Air National Guard airplane. The medical team in the back end is Air, Air Force Reserve. And the critical care team that's over on the bottom right of this picture treating the critically wounded patients on this flight is active duty Air Force. This is what the total force means to our Air Force. Those patients can't tell the difference. That's the way it should be. Neither can the enemy. Next slide. And this is the last mission we, can, we conduct, which is command and control. This is the Air Operations Center that runs the air war in the Middle East. It's in the Gulf area. We have a ton of airmen who work this. Most of them are very young. They're scary young when you meet them. They're incredibly tech savvy, and they run all air operations in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, the Arabian Gulf, and everywhere in the region. They can do anything from 120 sorties a day to 2,000 sorties a day with all the targeting and the strategy development that must come with it. They're phenomenally good at this. Next slide. So that's what we do. And these are the things we stand for. They're corny, but we like corny. And we stand behind it. That Airman's Creed are the things that kind of bind us together, faithful to a proud heritage, tradition of honor. We defend our country with our lives. And I will not fail. Every Airman knows this creed and believes it. The core values are the things we rely on to get us through every day. Integrity, service, and excellence are more than three words. They're kind of the bedrock of service to our country. And when things get really rocky, when things get turbulent, when it's tough to operate in the environment you're in, these are the things you fall back on. Next slide. So let me transition a little bit to that thought. Because times are turbulent. There's change happening in everywhere. You guys know this as, as well or better than I do. The pace of change is the thing we're most concerned about. We think the biggest threat to our Air Force is being able to stay ahead of that rate of change over time because our institution is not nimble. It has to become strategically agile to be successful in the future. But everything's changing. Demographics are changing. Ideologies are changing. Politics are changing. The world order is changing. And technology has run off like a rabbit will never catch at the track. And we've got to figure out how we bring up young leaders to work in these times. Leadership is an extreme sport all the time. But in this kind of environment, it's important that we take time to talk to the people that we're developing and highlight a couple of important things to them. Let me tell you the things I tell my folks. Next slide. By the way, when I think of leading in uncertain times, I think about this guy a lot. Can you imagine being Dwight Eisenhower talking to these paratroopers the day before D-Day and telling them that the future of the world is in their hands? And then trusting that they're going to follow your commander's intent as they go into that hell? What a remarkable, remarkable time this must have been for leaders. Next slide. I believe there are a couple of imperatives if you're going to lead in turbulent times. The first one is that if you're going to lead when everything around you is unstable, as a leader, you must create stability. You must create certainty. And that certainty is in the minds of the people who follow you. And what that certainty must be is that not only can you succeed, but success is inevitable. In our business, there is no second place. So it's a little easier for me to have this conversation. You either win or you're dead. You have a little bit different problem. It's more nuanced. But the fact is, if your workforce believes that success is inevitable, you will win. Next slide. To do that, you have got to be credible. And so when I talk to my young commanders who are growing up, I try and stress this idea of credibility to them over and over and over again. It goes with that integrity thing a little bit. You know, one of the great things about this nation is that we have these people who stand up, who work for other people during the daytime, and then on weekends they come forward and say, I serve my country. 
the Minuteman is probably the earliest and maybe the proudest symbol of American patriotism. One of the fascinating things I've learned over time is that that Minuteman may not be a man at all. This is Heather Penny. Her tactical call sign is Lucky. She was the Air National Guard's first female fighter pilot. On 9-11, she was stationed in the Air National Guard unit, F-16 unit in Maryland at Andrews Air Force Base, the DC unit. Heather's dad is a guy named John Penny. He's a 767 pilot for United Airlines at that time. He's also a very famous airplane race pilot in the United States of America. He's won more races at Reno than anybody else has. He's a legend in that sport. And Heather's didn't fall far from the tree. She's got the gift. Whatever it is that some pilots have, she's got it. On that morning, she and her wing commander, a guy named Mark Sasseville, were briefing a mission, a training mission, finished their briefing, walked out to the desk, and everybody was staring at the TV. Now, I don't know where you were on 9-11, but if you were like me, you were probably standing in front of a TV, too, staring at it. One of the fascinating things that happens at times like that is while most people sit stunned and watch the action, some people, against all the laws of human con conduct, charge toward the carnage. Firefighters, policemen, Heather Penny. Heather was told to stay at the desk because they had a mission coming in. She and her flight lead stood there for about 10 minutes. A call came in. They were told to get to their airplanes. They were being scrambled to intercept a flight that was turning around just west of Pennsylvania and heading back toward Washington. Turned out to be Flight 93, United Flight 93. Heather had breakfast with her dad that morning. She knew he was flying off the East Coast somewhere, but she didn't know from where. And her first thought was, God, my dad might be flying that airplane. They get to the airplane, they crank the engines, they call back inside and they're told, you have a launch order, your job is to intercept Flight 93. Her flight lead comes on the radio and says, we don't have any weapons. And the answer was, I know, we don't have time to arm you. So as they taxied out to take off, they talked on their backup radio about the plan. And essentially the plan was the flight lead saying, I got the cockpit, and Heather replying, I got the tail. So she took off on what she thought was her last airplane sortie with a plan to ram a U.S. airliner to prevent it from returning and striking in Washington, D.C. Absolutely certain that the pilot was her father. Can you imagine? Now, Flight 93 went down before they got there, and it was, was not her dad. But I, I, I put myself into that situation, and I have a hard time even processing it. But I'll tell you what, Lucky Penny's got credibility in my business. When she stands up in front of a room of fighter pilots and says, we will do whatever is necessary to complete this mission, they believe her. I try to be as credible as she is every day. Next slide. Next slide, please. Second imperative is actually pretty straightforward as well, but not always easy. It's that you must be willing and be aggressive in making common sense the first standard you apply before any other standard. Because if you don't, your people will recognize it. They will know you don't know what you're doing. They will question your leadership. This is a base in Africa. It's really a remote place. We fly remotely piloted aircraft out of this place doing counterterrorism work. First time I visited, I was talking to a group of guys, probably 60 of them had gathered in a group. I asked them what it was like working here in the middle of nowhere. Because as we taxied in, I noticed all the runway lights were broken. And when I asked why they were broken, they said, oh, the, the baboons break them. They don't like them when they buzz at night. So they break all the lights and they leave their rock by the light so they have a tool there when they need to do it next time. <laughs> Which I thought was pretty entertaining. So I said, what else do you have problems with animals with? And they mentioned the day before they had a leopard on the runway. It was laying right on the center line, right on that yellow line. And as you come out of the terminal and turn onto the runway, there was this full-grown adult male leopard lying there. So I said, well, how'd you get it off the runway? And then I wish I'd never asked the question. Because here were the options they went through. The first plan, plan A, was to go out and shoo it off the runway. So three guys got about halfway there before they looked at each other and decided plan A might not be a great idea. <laughs> they retreated and came up with plan B, which is take the fire truck and we'll push it off the runway of the fire truck. So they pulled the fire truck out, went beak to beak with the leopard. They're looking out the window of the fire truck and the leopard's not impressed. 
And they stopped the truck, and the leopard looked underneath it and saw shade. So it stood up, walked under the truck, and laid down. <laughs> so now you got a leopard on the center line with a fire truck on top of it. And they can't move the truck because they're afraid of hurting the leopard. Plan C, they have poles on the side of fire trucks. So if you take one of those poles and you poke at the leopard, clearly he will run out the other side of the truck. They tried that till the leopard gave them a, I don't like this plan noise, and they all jumped into plan D, which was to leap on the side of the truck and hang three feet off the ground, about eight feet from a full-grown leopard that probably has a 20-foot vertical leap <laughs> and may not have eaten that morning. <laughs> that lasted about 20 seconds, and they made eye contact and went, plan E. They dropped, they ran back in the cab of the truck, and they decided they would tranquilize it. Better plan. So they call in on the radio and they get the med tech, who is fully trained in this kind of thing, and tell them, mix up a tranquilizer. So I'm on it. So the med tech starts doing whatever they did. Then they had to find something to use to, to tranquilize, put this stuff in. So they looked for a tranquilizer gun in the terminal. Nobody could find one. But it was OK, because they found a big yellow plastic syringe. Now all they needed was a volunteer. <laughs> and astonishingly, the youngest airman volunteered and was on his way out to the airfield with this, this thing in his hand to do whatever he was going to do with it when the chief master sergeant who was on this deployment showed up and went, what the hell are you doing? Now, these are really talented, really aggressive, really mission-oriented, type A, incredibly successful professionals. And common sense completely took a vacation. So I remind all our young leaders growing up that I don't care what the circumstances are. I don't care how fast the bullets are flying. I don't care how ugly it is or how confusing it is or how much fog and friction is around you. You are the common sense monitor all the time. You guys know how important that is, this is. And it's something we forget to remind our people. And when we do, it takes a vacation. Next slide. And finally, as far as imperatives go, next slide. You got to believe in your team. And you got to convince your team that you believe in your team. They have to know that you'll be there for them and confident that they will be there for you. During the first Gulf War, I was an F-16 squadron commander. Um, on the first day of the ground war, we'd flown airstrikes for about 30 days against the, the Iraqis. And then the first day of the ground war, we were flying up in the northern Kuwait, southern Iraq region. And an F-16 pilot named Billy Andrews was shot down. And he crash landed right in the middle of a Republican Guard armor division that was retreating up where those oil fires were in southern Iraq. And somebody came on our strike frequency and said, we've lost an airplane. Here's the coordinates. I need to know who's got the gas and the weapons to go help with a search and rescue effort. And there was just instant silence on the strike frequency as everybody looked at maps and tried to figure out where this was. And very clearly, all of us knew after 30 days of flying over these guys, they weren't happy. And he was right in the middle of a division that we had been pounding day and night. It was a horrible place to eject from an airplane and land. The first voice that came up on the strike frequency was an Army helicopter pilot. We could tell that because every type of airplane had its own type of call signs. You know, F-16s that I was flying, we were all dog call signs, so collie or pointer or something like that. And so we knew this was a helicopter pilot. In fact, it was a helicopter of a Chinook, just like this one. And the pilot said, OK, I've got the gas. I'll go pick him up. And my first thought was, you're going to fly that thing? It's about the size of a double-decker London bus. It's not very well armed. And they're going to fly that helicopter into the middle of a retreating armor division to pick up this one airman. We give each other grief between services in the United States military. But I'll tell you what, I'll follow that helicopter pilot into battle any day. Now, unfortunately, Billy was captured. The mission never had to continue. But I promised myself that I was going to go meet this pilot because I will never forget her voice. She inspired us. She was so calm about the whole thing. Hey, I will pick him up. It was just unbelievably impressive. I told this story to a group of people after the war, and one of the people in the room had just transferred from the Army to the Air Force, a young enlisted guy. And he said, I know who that was. There was only one Chinook female helicopter pilot who is combat certified at that time. Her name's Marie Rossi, and she's assigned to Fort Stewart, Georgia. Next slide. So I did some research, and sure enough, Major Marie Rossi was the only combat qualified Chinook aircraft commander at that point in time in the United States Army. So I decided I was going to go meet her and just thank her. Next slide. It took me about three months to find her. 
She's in Section 8 of Arlington National Cemetery with 400,000 other heroes. The day the war ended, that night, she and her crew were called from their forward desert base at about 2 in the morning to fly near Kuwait City and pick up a soldier whose hands had been damaged as he tried to pick up unexploded ordnance. She picked him up and was flying back to the border base when she hit an unmarked radio tower that was not lit and was not on anybody's map. And the whole helicopter was lost, crew was killed, as was the young soldier they picked up. But I'd promised, so. Next time I was in DC, I went and found her and I stood in front of this rock and I thanked her for her courage and her sacrifice and her commitment and the inspiration she gave us that day. I found myself standing in attention for some strange reason. One of my sons, when I told him about this, said, did you feel silly standing there? And I said, no, just humble and very proud. Next slide. You gotta believe your team's gonna be there because they will be. When you need them most, they will be there. A couple of other things I'd ask you just to keep in mind as you talk to your young folks. Next slide. I met this guy in a hospital, Walter Reed. Somebody told me an airman was in the hospital. I was there visiting somebody else. They said a new airman just got out of the ICU. So I walked down the hall and said hi. He was lying in bed. He was covered from about here down with blankets. I asked him what had happened. I never didn't know who he was or where he'd come from. And he said, well, I'm, I uh, you know, hurt my hip. And I said, OK, great. You know, What's your name? His name was Zach. Um, I noticed that he got the body I was supposed to get. So that depressed me a little bit. He, <laughs> incredibly fit young guy. I mean, just an incredible young man. But very, very uh, interesting guy because he was so controlled. I don't, I don't know a better word. Confident, controlled, not intimidated by anything. He was hurting bad. You could see it in his eyes, but he smiled the whole time I was in the room. I was only there a few minutes, so I didn't really get a chance to ask a lot about him when the nurse came in and said, we really need to get him to sleep here. So I told him I'd come back next trip there, and I left. And on the way out, I looked at his name on the door, that little name tag, Zach Reiner. So I went back and I Googled Zach Reiner and found out that Zach Reiner is an Air Force Combat Controller. In 2008, Zach Reiner was awarded the Air Force Cross, which is the nation's second highest award for valor. He's credited with saving his 10-man team in an ambush where they were ambushed in a mountain valley as they tried to go after a bomb maker one night by 200 Taliban fighters in the cliffs above and around him. He called in airstrikes for six hours after being wounded in the first 15 minutes of the battle crawled out to the middle of a clearing so his radios would work, fired at the enemy with one hand and directed air power with the other. Everybody there credits him with saving their life. Now, I met him in 2013. It turns out he didn't really just hurt his hip. He was wounded again. By the way, if you look at this picture, his right eye is closed. Right side of his face is bruised. If you look close, you can see it. That was another, that was another yeah, I hurt myself. Before he was awarded the Air Force Cross, he'd actually been wounded on another deployment to Afghanistan. So the third one was when I met him in the hospital. He'd been shot in the, in the upper hip, severed his, uh, broke his, shattered his hip socket, severed his sciatic nerve. Pretty serious injury. He'd been basically unconscious because of the pain until they brought him out of medically induced coma when he got to Walter Reed. Amazing young man. But I didn't bother to ask him quick enough who he was, where he came from, what is your story? And I tell my young leaders, every airman has a story. The stories are remarkable. Some of them are inspirational, some of them are a little depressing. They're unique, just like in your businesses. Everybody has a story. And if you don't know the story, you flat can't lead the person. It's that simple in the, in the human business. So I tell my people to learn the stories. Next slide. Another thing I tell them is that you are the most important conversation in your people's day. Just like all of you are the most important conversation in your people's day. There aren't that many casual conversations when they bump into you and say, hey, can I talk to you for a second, boss? It's probably not a chance encounter. They might have been stalking you for two weeks trying to work up the courage. Same thing's true in our business. This is Charlie Baldwin. Charlie Baldwin, looking at that group, will make every one of them feel when they leave like he was talking directly to them. I don't know how he does it. It's a gift. He was our Air Force Command chaplain. But so I tell our young leaders, be like Charlie Baldwin. Make sure that everyone you talk to believes that they were the most important conversation in your day. If you can do that and nothing else, you win as a leader. 
Next slide. This is one some of our people have trouble with until they figure it out. It scares them a little bit. Everybody who's ever worked for me is better than me at something. Most of them are better than me at a whole bunch of things, and some of them are better than me at everything, including leadership. That is an incredibly powerful tool for me, as long as I'm not intimidated by it. But it takes a while to get past that. I think most of you have dealt with this before. This is an air medical evacuation crew. They were the crew on a flight called Bandage 33 that flew out of Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan one day in 2013. The lady on the left is Adriana Valadez. She is a nurse. She's an Air Force reservist in her, in her regular job. She works in the, ICU, in the ICU as a trauma nurse at the San Antonio Military Medical Center. She's been in the Air Force for 12 years. She's incredibly good at what she does. This was her first combat deployment. As they took off that day and went into Mazari Sharif up in the north of Afghanistan, they were, they were brought a litter as they left there of a soldier who'd been hit. The guy had been wounded. She couldn't tell who he was, where he's from. She didn't have any details about the guy. He had a beard and he was hurting. They'd done a quick surgery at, ba at Mazari Sharif to stabilize his wounds. They put him on the C-130. They had one more stop to make before they went to the hospital with him at Bagram. But he looked stable, so they took off and headed to this other stop. As Soon as they got airborne, he started to bleed again. Adriana called the pilot, who actually was my son John, Air Force Academy roommate, a guy named Ryan Thornton. And she said, Thornton, forget the other pickup. Turn to Bagram. You got to get him there now. This guy's going to fade. Three minutes later, the blood pressure started dropping. The bleeding increased. She had her hands in his wounds, trying to squeeze them off to keep the blood from accelerating. They were pumping blood in him as fast as it was coming out. As they headed into Bagram from the north, there's a bunch of mountains. And the C-130, this was an older one, was vibrating and shaking. Those of you who have flown in will know this. And she was having a tough time staying on her feet next to the litter. So finally, as they hit the turbulence over the mountains in this rapid descent, and it got too tough for her to stand, there's now blood on the plates of the airplane. She told her team, strap me to the litter. So they st literally strapped her to the patient. And she's now got hands and entry and exit wounds, just squeezing whatever she can squeeze. They hit the ground, ambulance meets them on the runway, they load the litter, her, him, everything into the ambulance. She continues to do this till they get him to the emergency room. They get him into surgery, they save his life, they save his leg. I can't imagine doing that. She does it for a living. By the way, I asked her when I first met her, did you ever meet the guy later and find out who he was? She goes, no, I have no idea who he was. I was able to find out. Next slide. She saved an American hero. And if you talk to Zach Reiner, he'll tell you there's only one hero in this picture. And he's not wearing a beret. You got to believe in your team. Next slide. You got to realize how good they are. When I talk to my emerging leaders, I tell them they're going to be in jobs for the rest of their career that will consume them if they let it happen. It will separate them, their family, their friends, their activities, that whatever they do, whatever they value, the job will consume you. And they can't let that happen. Because the most valuable thing to me about leadership in the Air Force as it grows is that it reflects the values that our service represents, the strength of family, the importance of commitment, the prioritization that a human being needs to have that is above and beyond what they commit to day-to-day -to -day training. That's what our nation stands for. The way I tell them is this. I tell them that on the day I die, when I'm laying on that bed wondering whether I won or lost the game of life, the fact that I was the chief of staff of the United States Air Force or that I was a general in the United States Air Force or that I was in the United States Air Force is not going to be part of the equation. I'll be proud of all that. If Betty's standing there, holding my hand, I won. Next slide. If our four great kids are standing in a room looking at least a little upset, I won big. And if I think the grandkids are going to be upset when I don't show up to take them fishing Saturday, I crushed it. I try and remind our leaders that they, their priorities are not all professional. 
They can't be. Next slide. And finally, I asked him to remember that leadership is a gift. It's given by those who follow. And our job and their job every day for the rest of their professional life is to be worthy of it. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for letting me take time during this period uh, of your get together. Thanks so much for everything all of you do to support the industry of this nation, which makes a military possible. Thanks for the service you've given to our country. And thank you so much for those of you who support our airmen bases and families all over the world. Take care of yourself. <laughs>